Hi guys, um, this is the second week, or when you're seeing this, it should be about the second week, um, and it also is the second installment of our first year writing class. And what I would like to go over today is a little bit of a recap for over uh, some of the notes we did on Thursday. Um, unless you were in the 1230 class, then this will be all new to you, and this will be the first time through for you guys, so um, sorry. Zoom issues are, or should be resolved. In fact, the Zoom expert has attached himself to our website. Um, he's one of the uh, instructors. He's listed as one of the instructors on my site. So if there's any problem, um, he's watching us from above to so make sure it works. It, we had a, Apparently we had a very um, interesting problem that he's never encountered before. He said that everything should be working. So that made me feel better. It wasn't anything I was screwing up. It was Zoom. It wasn't me. Anyway. Uh, back to what I wanted to talk about. Today I want to talk about, like I said, a little bit of a recap of Bloom and Perry and those guys to kind of give you a framework of how uh, the Academy looks at you, how I'm going to be looking at you, what I expect from you in your writing this semester. And then the next um, installment will be what I call active reading. And that act of reading should give you a little bit more context and a little bit deeper understanding of your reading that was assigned this week. Mortimer Adler's How to, how to Mark a Book. Oh, I got my hat on stuff. Oh, well, that's okay. This is my hat. I wear this. People know me by my hat. Anyway. Uh, anyway let's get back to it. I'm going to go into two, um, share screen. And I'm going to, I, I'm already in Blackboard. Let's just see Daniel Moore. He's the guy that's the, uh, the the Zoom guy that's watching over us from above. Let's just go into a 101. First thing I want to go over, just to recap, I sent you an email and I put this on Blackboard. Um, despite saying in class and in, in, in telling you this, I still had a lot of people saying, I don't know how to submit a paper. Um, when we were doing the, the poll, even um, at the, in, in one of the first days of class, one of the uh, questions was, what is the proper format for some, some, submitting a paper? Uh, I feel I need to go over this again because I had more than one person say, I didn't know, don't know how to submit a paper. It's your SIU email written to my SIU email with a word attachment to it, not PDF, not SharePoint, none of that stuff. And the reason I told you is because I don't want papers coming from all over the place and me trying to puzzle out uh, where's it coming from and who's got it, you know, and, and what it is. I want one channel uh, from you to me to send me papers. Um, I was a little more forgiving the first week because things are going crazy, but I'm going to insist on all papers from now on, and if you don't send it to me through this channel, I'm not going to accept it because this is what you should be doing, okay? I've said with that. You you know what to do. Uh, again, I've got it on Blackboard. I sent you an email. That's how you send me your papers, all right? I uh, beat that to death. Let's go to week two. Okay. Uh, this week you're doing a savage life. Uh, savage just means cruel. It doesn't necessarily mean savage as in Native Americans. Okay, um, we're not. It's not a disparaging term. It's just a descriptor. And it's about a woman who kills her own chickens, and the feelings that she has um, killing those chickens. The assignment you have this week is to use the accompanying sheet um, to after you read the story. We first read the story. Then take this accompanying sheet, and I want you to go through line by line, answering the questions in that sheet, okay? So just paragraph one, here's three questions, answer the questions. That's going to be taking the place of your micro theme this week. And what that is is an act of reading. Uh, the, what you're doing is active reading. It's an active reading um, um, exercise in that instead of you asking the questions, I've asked the questions, your job is to to find the, the answers, develop the answers as you're reading in the story, using the text of the story as, as kind of a base. You know, you're not just pulling this out of the air. You're saying, well, according to the context, according to what she's saying, how I see it is X, okay? Um, what I want you to do is de 
get to a stage where you're asking your own questions. You don't need a worksheet from me that you're filling out. Uh, you know, I want you to be more proactive, and, and you're going to ask and answer your own questions when you're doing any kind of reading. That's active reading. And that's pretty much what Mortimer or Adler was talking about in his story, um, you know, How to Mark a Book. Active reading. You don't just race to the end. You actually are paying homage to the author by taking the time to slow down, to understand each word, um, circling it, starring it, as he says, put a little doodads by it, come up with your own little code, your own conversation with the author in your head. And it is, it's like that. It's like having a conversation instead of having a lecture dumped at you. You're going to learn a lot more when you can, you can become interactive. Um, I wish, I wish, I wish this is a little bit more interactive in this video. Um, that's why I like Zoom, because you can talk to me, I can talk to you. But, um, you know, it's better than nothing. So, it's, it's don't, don't sacrifice the, the good for the perfect, as they like to say. Okay, so one of the things you're doing this, this week is um, A Savage Life. Um, read it, know it, understand it, and then come up and fill out that worksheet. It goes through paragraph by paragraph. Um, the other thing is I'm starting a writer's biography this week. It's due week four. What is the writer's biography, you might ask? Uh, we'll go over that pretty soon. But basically, what I want you to do is to tell me who you are as a writer. Again, I'll go over this before the end of the video. What I mean by that is I want you to think of yourself as a writer. You are an author. You are a generator of text. You create texts all the time. You may not think you do, but as a human being in the 21st century, yes, you do. You are on this all the time. You text message all the time. You are creating a rhetorical act. You are creating a text to convey an idea that's in you to a particular audience using a particular grammar and syntax and form to convey an idea. You just authored something, okay? Whenever you, you put, I'll post something on Facebook, whenever you uh, post a, a you know, use Reddit or, or one of those, TikTok or one of those, you're creating texts, you know, to, to appeal to an audience. You're, you're imagining how that audience is going to receive your text and understand it. Um, and your audience also is working with you to say, okay, what did he or she mean when she created this text? Okay. So you're doing all these rhetorical acts. It may not be academic discourse, but you're very, very definitely an author. So what I want you to do in uh, writer's biography, and again, we'll go over this again before the end of this video, but very quickly, um, what I want you to do is think of yourself as a writer, and how did you get to this place? How did you get to your um, perspectives, your attitudes, your engagement, or lack thereof with writing? Okay. Um, kind of imagine this. You didn't come into the world hating writing. You didn't come in, you know, in the nursery saying, boy, I hope nobody gives me a pen or a pencil because I can't, I don't want to write. I hate writing. You know, the, there were events that shaped who you are. So I want you to go back and look at those events. Okay. And it's, this is going to be a longer essay. So you have an, uh, enough room and space and time to, to really uh, develop some ideas. I want you to look at these events and theorize, hypothesize, you might say, um, because this happened at this age, this is the attitude I have now towards writing, or this affected me this way, or, you know, this is why I got, a, I got an award in fifth grade, so now I'm going to, you know, that's why I love writing. Or I had really rotten English teachers, and that's why I really hate writing. But again, I want you to expand outside of school. In fact, I do not, do not, do not, do not, Want a paper that's just, I did this in fifth grade, this in seventh grade, this in 12th grade, the end. I don't want that. I don't want, A, I don't want it to just be a data dump. Here's a whole bunch of stuff I did with no analysis. I want you to analyze it. But B, I want you to get outside of school writing. Again, text is a lot broader than you think. Writing is a lot broader than you think. I don't want you to just say, I hate school writing, and that's the attitude I'm bringing to school because this is school writing, so therefore I hate this and I hate you and I can't do this and I'm done, all right? I don't want you to do that. I want you to think of writing more as a human endeavor and less of a, a, a school exercise. Not that school writing will ever be texting, okay? 
But if there's something about texting that engages you, that you really enjoy, that really empowers you, and, they, and you do it all the time, you do it to the point where it interrupts your class because you're doing it under the table or something like that, right? Um, if, you, if you really like texting that much, but there's something about school writing you hate, I want you to analyze it. Look at that system as the sum of its parts. What are the individual elements of texting that engage you? What are the individual elements of, of school writing that disengage you? And that's how I want you to look at it. I don't want you to look at it as a moral judgment. It's bad, it's good, I like it, I don't like it. Heck with that. More like, this works for me. This doesn't work for me. It engages me, it doesn't engage me, okay? Again, not that school writing will ever be text messaging, right? That, that ain't gonna happen. But if there are elements in texting that I can draw into school writing, and make it a little less odious, let's do it. Again, I'm not looking for you to be obedient. I'm looking to co-construct this class with you. And this class for you is only gonna have enough engagement and meaning. Um, it's, it, that engagement and meaning is going to be based on how much you are truthfully willing to work with me, all right? This is a very real writing exercise. In fact, I, it's not even an exercise. This is a diagnostic essay. This is telling me who's in my classroom, um, how well do you write by the actual document itself? Because I'm giving you a nice big fat document to really display your writing skills in, right? But it's also how you analyze, how you work, and also who you are as a writer. Who have I got in my classroom? You know, what works, what doesn't work for you. And if that, and if that, um, if I can, again, if I can adjust the class accordingly, tweak it out, this is the first real handshake I'm going to have with you guys to get to know who you are so I can adjust the lessons accordingly as much as I can uh, to meet you in the middle. But that's not what I want to talk about right now. Uh, let's go down to lecture notes. This is what I plan to do anyway, but you know what they say about the best laid plans. All right. Let's recap Bloom and Perry and all those guys. I'm one of those guys. This is how the Academy sees you as students. This is how um, I see you. And this is what you need to know what our plans are, okay? Instead of, again, education is something that's done to you, it's done with you. So instead of me knowing all this stuff, thinking, hmm, how am I going to construct a class to, to, to uh, you know, address these, these issues, um, I'd rather work with you and say, this is what we need to do. Here's our goal. How do we get you from here to here? And you work with me, you know? Uh, first one we went over, we'll go over it again, is Bloom's Taxonomy. Benjamin Bloom was a cognitive psychologist who studied how knowledge emerges in, in human beings, how every baby, every human being, no matter where you are, no matter your culture, goes through these distinct stages in this order for knowledge. Uh, the first level of knowledge is, is, or I'm sorry, Bloom's taxonomy is knowledge. It's just getting a bit of information in your head and it's there, okay? It's stuck in your memory banks. You don't necessarily understand it. Um, you can't really do anything with it. It's just there is a bit. The second level is comprehension. You got it in your head and you understand what it is. All right. Um, the third one is application. You know it, you understand it, and you can apply it to different situations. So if I was to say, uh, I think I used this ex example in one of the classes. I said uh, one plus one equals two. You understand the concept of one. You understand if you take one thing and put it to another thing, you've got two things, okay? That's comprehension. The third level is if I say go out in the hallway and count uh, chairs, uh, as long as there were two chairs in the hallway, you would search your memory banks and say, okay, I need to count chairs. What do I need? I, I've got the knowledge of one plus one is two. I understand that I can apply that to this situation. I know that it's appropriate to apply that skill to this situation, okay? These are called, the reason I have these separated from these, is these are called the lower level thinking skills. If you ever hear um, teachers saying, or you know, instructors, educators saying uh, lower level and upper level thinking skills, they're talking about Benjamin Bloom, they're talking about this guy here. Right? That's what they're concerned with in K through 12. Do you know it? Do you comprehend it? Can you apply it? We're done. 
So writing, what you think is writing up to this point, was focused on just those skills. So if you got a research paper, and they don't even call it a research paper, even though I, it's really just a summary. But if they say research, um, you know, George Washington, you'll go to a book that's already written with all this knowledge in it of a history book of George Washington, and you'll write down all the, you know, pertinent facts and hand it in. So what they're looking for is, did you know what we wanted you to do? Did you comprehend the assignment? Um, can you apply this in your own words, um, all this new knowledge that you've got? Good, we're done. Okay. The genres of writing that you've done up to this point, and that's why I want you to kind of reserve judgment on, I hate writing because you haven't really been exposed to what writing really is and all the aspects and facets of it. You may have hated the prep part of writing, okay, like the grammar, the worksheets, and that kind of stuff, but you, you haven't really done real writing yet. At this level, what we're doing at this level in college are the upper level skills. That's the next three, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And it's going to be a completely different world. Up to this point, when you've been doing K through 12 writing, they've shared this in common. You've done broadly three types of writing. You've done a report, even the research papers a report, which is basically a summary report. You know, here's a whole bunch of smart guys that said all this stuff. I'm putting it in my own words. Ta-da. Okay. Or you've done a persuasion, which is I like uh, McDonald's hamburgers and it's better than Burger King's hamburgers. And here's the reasons why that I'm right. You know? Or it's been a personal narrative, what I did in camp last summer. You know? But the thing about these papers that you, that, that they, that they had in common was you knew where the end was going to be. You would fill them up. You'd get to the end of the paper. You'd say, okay, I had to do a five page paper. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. I got five pages. Boom. I'm done. Right. With real research, you don't know where the end is going to be. When you're doing real research at the university level, you don't know what the answer is until you start writing. I mean, think about it. If you're going to do research into um, the cure for COVID, you don't start with a thesis saying, if we, you know, take this drug, it'll cure COVID. And then look for the research. It doesn't work that way. You don't start with the thesis. You start with the question, what is COVID? What, is, you know, um, what works, what doesn't work, what experiments are out there, that kind of stuff. So, but you don't know where the end is going to be if there's going to be an end. That's the other thing. You have to be comfortable with discomfort. So when I give you a research paper, um, and, and you'll hear this more and more as you go on in your college career, and you say, how many pages does it need to be? Um, I won't give you a page number. I'll give you a minimum. Okay, um, because in my experience, for example, six pages, you can't really comprehensively do a decent uh, job studying any kind of issue in fewer than six pages, you know. But I can't tell you that at page seven, you're going to come up with the answer. I don't even know if there is an answer. But I do guarantee this, at the end of your research, at the end of your analysis, your investigation, you're going to come up with something you'll be able to say at the end of the paper that you could have said at the beginning. You'll, you'll have knowledge, you'll have a position. You may not have the ultimate answer, but you'll, you'll be that farther, that much farther ahead. All right, let's get back to Bloom. Uh, analysis, what is analysis? What does it mean, at least in this context? Analysis in Bloom's taxonomy is basically understanding a complex system as the sum of its parts. You take something apart, you see how those parts interact, you can put it back together the exact same way, and you've just analyzed, as far as Bloom is concerned, you know. The example I think I used in class was a car engine. You take a car engine apart, you see how the pistons interact with the crankshaft, with the intake manifold, with the exhaust, and all that kind of stuff. You can take it apart, put it together, there it is. Synthesis is a little different. Synthesis involves analysis of many different systems. But what you're doing with synthesis is you're taking you're looking at these different systems. You're taking bits and pieces of those systems, bringing it together and creating something new that didn't exist before. Okay. Uh, the example I gave in class was my neighbor who almost blew up his house. Uh, he had a little two horsepower uh, electric home generator. He had a 200 horsepower uh, engine or electrical motor that you'd use to, I think it was a starter motor for some giant engine. And then he had a car body. He took that 
electrical motor, put it in the car body. He took that generator, that house generator, bolted that in there, hooked up the, 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 the motor. And his idea was he's going to make this hybrid car that got all kinds of mileage. You didn't need a battery for it because that generator was going to feed that motor and he's going to be a millionaire. And again, it, it, it didn't work. How I found out about all this stuff was his, when he tried to start the car, his dashboard caught on fire and almost burned his house down. <laughs> But it's a good example of synthesis. He took this one piece of a system, the house generator. It was meant just for a house. When your lights go out, you know, that's it. He took this starter motor that was made for a jet. He took this car body that was made for gasoline engines. So he threw three parts of three systems, synthesized it together, brought all those parts together, and made something new that didn't exist before. This is what we're going to be looking for in your writing throughout the year. We're going to be looking for, you know, if I gave you uh, the, the same assignment from high school, write six pages on George Washington, although I really can't see myself doing that, but if I did, instead of you going to Joe Smart Guy that wrote the book and summarizing the book and saying, therefore, I know everything about George Washington now, what I would want you to do is look at, say, um, the historical context of the 18th century. Look at the political context. Look at um, the the interactions of sociology of people during that time. Look at all these different contexts. Look at the military structure of the United States. Look at the beginning parts of the United States. The the beginning um, you know upswell of of politics in the United States. Look at all these complex systems. Take bits and pieces that apply to your thesis, your emerging thesis that's appropriate to you, and create something that didn't exist before, a new perspective. You're bringing your lens, your thinking, your thought processes together to connect these data sets and, and create something that didn't exist before. So basically, that leads me to the third part. One of the things we're looking for is your evaluation, your perspective, your lens. So you see all this stuff. How do you see it pull together? How do you evaluate it? How do you create something? You know, how, how did you work? In other words, how did you create something that didn't exist before? Is this even worth more further study? Does this have a broader application? Okay. All right. Uh, moving on. I don't have it written down here, but I will. Uh, one of the things that we talked about is Keith's taxonomy. And I figure if, uh, you know, our good buddy Benjamin Bloom can have a taxonomy, why can't I, right? And this is what I came up with. Whoops. Oops. Okay, so those five points. Um, again, when you were doing any kind of active reading, when you're doing any kind of analysis in this class, when what you are doing, your, your overriding question, the mental habit of mind you need to develop is why. Um, when you have an author that's writing a, a, a book or a director that's, that's, you know, directing a movie or whatever, they could start with any person, any scene, any word, any, anything, right? Uh, they very purposefully choose their words. Directors, when they're making movies, very purposely choose their scenes to have what we call a rhetorical effect, to, to, to kind of create this effect in you to convey this message. Um, they'll pour over every frame of film with a jeweler's lens trying to make sure they have just the right angle, just the right color, just the right film. You know, um, authors will spend a long time trying to come up with just the right line that will hook you into... Uh, understanding, you know, to, to bring you into their story and help you understand what they're trying to say. So what you need to do, your job, is not to passively sit there and say, I understand what these words are, running my eyes over it, therefore I'm done. You know, you don't want to do that. That's, that's, that's just decoding. What I want you to do is ask why. So in, in um, a, let's start out with um, A Savage Life. You've got this, this title that's kind of vague. A Savage Life. What is, why did she choose that as a title? Especially now that you're downstream after you read it, um, why, why, uh, why Savage? Why Life? Why did she talk about life? You know, especially since I've already given you part of the story is she's killing things. Why, why the juxtaposition of life against death? Why is it savage? Why did she use the word savage instead of 
you know, some other word. And that's one way you can analyze things is kind of like change the change the, the words around. If you're trying to watch a movie and you're trying to figure out why the author used one particular person and another, change it mentally in your head. What, what if that were a woman saying that instead of a man? What if that was an older person instead of a younger person? What if it was a person of color instead of a white kid? You know, that kind of stuff. Change it around. See how you feel and then say, oh, okay, maybe that's the feeling that the author was, was going for. And that helps you get a little bit more deep meaning out of, out of your words, out of your reading. So that's why. The next one is so what. Uh, so what is the purpose of this writing? So what is the, what am I supposed to get out of it? What's in it for me? How, what's a broader human application from this? What can I learn from this from this story? You know, what does it illustrate of uh, the human condition that we can all connect to, that we can all maybe um, at least think about? If not solve the problem, at least think about the problem, illustrate the problem, maybe from a different point of view. She's talking about um, kill your own chickens for her own food. Most of us, I dare say, don't do that. Um, so she's basically putting you in her lens, and she's saying, this is what I do, this is how it feels, this is why I do it. You may not have to agree with her, you know, you don't have to agree with her, but you know, you, you at least get to see the world through the way you, she makes sense of it. You see the world through her lens. And this is what I was saying before also. You may come up with a thesis for your paper. I don't have to agree with your paper. You know, I don't have to agree with your thesis. But if you've got sound evidence and reasoning, you make logical connections uh, among and between your data sets, and it supports your thesis, that's okay with me. I can reject your thesis and still give you an A for the paper. I can even accept your thesis, and you would fail the paper, if you don't have the logic there, because this isn't a persuasion paper. This is an analysis. This is showing me your perspective. And as long as you, you know, are good at showing me your point of view, this is the way you see it. We're golden. Same way with this, this article here. You don't necessarily have to agree with this lady, what she's doing with the chickens. I don't care. I don't care if you agree with it or disagree with it. Was she effective in conveying her point of view? And if so, how was she effective in conveying it? Anyway, says who? Um, again, don't make a claim and leave it hanging out in space, um, not knowing who's saying what. Be careful for a couple of reasons. One is you don't want to run into plagiarism problems. You don't want to, a lot of you now are at a level of rhetorical sophistication where your voice is very close to oftentimes your source's voice. And unless you make it clear that I say this and Joe Blow says that, you could really run into some plagiarism. You know, your voice runs into it. I've had this a couple of times with my students that brought me papers and I'm reading along and it's like, this is really great. My students got good ideas. And all of a sudden, bam, there's a citation. Okay, how much of the preceding was you and how much of it was your source? I don't know. Tell me who's saying what. But also part of the says who is it with says you is you have a voice, you have an ethos, you have a perspective. For example, you're first year students, you're better than being first year students than I'll ever be. I need this information, I need that authority from you, that ethos. Um, so tell me, use that ethos. If you don't have that ethos, um, don't say, I say we should, you know, do whatever, make this change with, uh, uh, you know, rocket science so we can send ships farther out in space. If you don't know what the heck you're talking about, that's where your sources come in. You're not saying it, your sources do. Don't pretend the knowledge you don't have. Uh, prove it. Well, that's kind of what you're doing with the says who and the, and the, uh, the so what and the why. You're proving it. That kind of it's like a logical next step. Think of your audience as being very skeptical. Think that your audience isn't going to believe it just because you say it, uh, that your audience is an unfriendly reader and they're going to try to poke holes in everything you say. All right. So you want to make sure you cover yourself. It's not me saying it. Here's this smart guy who wrote this book who said we should do this to rockets, you know. So therefore, take it up with him. Don't take it up with me. You know, use your source as your ethos in that case. Um, another thing is by this being connected to this, this, I'm making a logical argument that this is the way it should be. A hypothesis, you know, and again, a hypothesis is just a starting point. Could be wrong, probably is wrong. Most hypotheses are wrong, but they give you a focus and a direction to go for further research. And that's what you're trying to say with your hypothesis. That's what you're trying to say with your prove it. You're saying, I see it this way. 
And this is our launching point for more information or, or for more discussion. Okay. You're not saying this is it beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's the ultimate truth for all people, all places, all times. You're not saying that. And when you get down to your hypothesis, when it's there, there it is fully formed. And let's say, my gosh, you've got this hypothesis emerging halfway through your paper. And it looks like this is where I'm going to go with this. This is look like what I'm going to end up with with my research. And all of a sudden, you're reading along, bam, you find in research something that just completely blows away your hypothesis. And the temptation is going to be there to say, well, we'll just ignore that and pretend that it never happened because I want to have this hypothesis. <laughs> you, know, you fall in love with your own words, right? Um, don't do that. Don't, don't think that, again, that we're, you're trying to win or lose with this. You're also not trying to, uh, you know, pr persuade me that this is the way it is and you need to believe it. So I'm going to front load all the stuff that, that uh, agrees with my point of view and I'm just going to ignore or downplay that that doesn't. You know, we don't want to do that either. What you want to do is make it an honest investigation. Look, I'm looking at all this data like a two-year-old asking questions, why, 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 and then I finally get to, oh, this is what it looks like to me and if it gets to the end of the paper and that's what it looks like, that's what it looks like. But as soon as somebody comes with another point of view somewhere else, you, you are prepared to let it go. So that's the maybe part. Um, you come up with this hypothesis, it may have passed all your muster, but still a maybe, because there may be something you didn't think about, maybe something that's discovered later on, maybe a new piece of data out there floating around um, that you can bring in, it'll, it'll blow your hypothesis apart. But that's okay. That's okay. You're not trying to persuade me, but nor are you looking for the ultimate truth that, apply, again, applies to everybody, all times, all places. What you're trying to do is do critical thinking. And part of critical thinking involves a type of intellectual honesty. And that honesty also involves admitting when you're wrong. Okay, admitting that you don't know every darn thing. In fact, the interesting thing about the, the switch from grad school, high school or uh, undergrad to grad school, is when you graduate from uh, undergrad, and you got your degree, and you're feeling so smart because you've read all this stuff and you know all this stuff, and you go into grad school, um, it's like your first night, it's like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. I don't know anything. This is, this is blowing me away, you know. Because, um, seriously, you don't. There's a, it's a big world out there. You don't know everything, but you're not required to know any, everything. You're just required to be able to process. And that's what I'm focused on is processing. All right. Yak, 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 Keith, I know. All right, here's the third guy that we went over. We're going to go over again. And that's, uh, here we go. William Perry, another cognitive psychologist who studied how college students, when they come to the university, how they make knowledge, how they, how their, their worldviews, okay? And he discovered that people went through these, these stages. I think there were nine, and again, I gave you the quick and dirty four. Uh, number one was binary thinking or basic dualism. Whoops. Ah. Why am I doing this? Said Keith to himself. Uh, that's number one. Let's put a number by it. We can do that. We have the technology. Uh, basic dualism, and that's the idea that there's uh, two answers to everything, two sides to every problem, and it's either right or wrong, and your uh, your job is to pick the right side and uh, bash the wrong side. So it's either right or wrong, left or right, up or down, black or white, one's good and one's bad, one's right and one's wrong, and that's it. Right? And you don't have any shades of gray. It has to, whenever you're approached with a problem, you want to just hammer it neatly into one hole or the other, Okay. And life doesn't work that way. You find out that life is messy and that there are um, shades of gray. And we introduce you to that in the, at the university. And what we do is we try to challenge you. We problemize is what we say in the biz. Um, if you say it's white, we'll give you 15 reasons why it should be black. If you say it's black, we'll give you 15 reasons why it should be white. And it just gets frustrating. And what happens is you kind of sort of give up. Real, uh, and you get to the stage where, well, everybody's got an opinion, and there really is no right or wrong answer. One's, anybody's answer is just as good as anybody else's answer, and your opinion is just as good as anybody else's. So your job then becomes, I'm just going to pick a side. I'm going to be 
liberal or I'm going to be, you know, conservative and this is my side and I'm going to defend my flag and I'm going to negate everything you say and I'm going to puff up everything I say and the idea is I'm going to win. And, and truth isn't decided that way. Um, in fact, I, I kind of hesitate to call it truth. I want to call it more appropriateness. Let's put it that way. Well, what happens as you go along? You find out that people are not monoliths, that uh, people in context and time and, and context really um, play into the appropriateness of any position. And then you come up with this next stage, relativism, contextual relativism. You find out that there's really no one overriding truth that applies to everybody, all times, all places, but you find that there are levels of, of truthiness, levels of appropriateness. What's appropriate for women? Is it appropriate for men? What's appropriate for rich people? Is it appropriate for poor people? What's appropriate for people in the Midwest may not be appropriate for people in California and so forth. So you've got these different contexts that, that affect the level of, of appropriateness. That's better. That's where we want you to, to start developing that way. Uh, but where we want you to end up at the end of the semester is here. Committed relativism. And what that means is you develop your own context. You see that men think this, women think that, rich people think this, poor people think that, and so forth. You're analyzing these systems. Again, remember that word. We're, we're looking at all the individual component pieces of these systems. You're taking what you need out of each system and repurposing it for your own thesis, your own claim that you're making in a paper. And you're saying, that's what these people say. Here's my position. Okay. So again, getting back to your, the, the paper I was talking about with uh, George Washington. You're looking at a historical context. You're looking at maybe an economic context, a political context, and so forth. Um, you look at all these complex systems, these, these contexts. You pick out what you need, in this case, specifically to um, support your emerging hypothesis on George Washington. You're not reciting everything that they said in history of the 18th century. It's just the stuff about George Washington applies to what you want to talk about. And then you create your own context. You create your own paper, your own thesis, your statement that's never been seen before. You know, you're not rehashing what somebody else said. According to Joe Smart Guy that wrote this book, and then you get to the end and say, I agree. That's not analysis. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for, look at all these different points of view. And, it, and if this is sound, and if this is true, if this is true about the history, if this is true about you know, the, the, the context of the time, if this is true about politics, I can make this statement now. Here's my hypothesis that fits all these data sets. And here's how I see it. Here's something new to bring to the conversation. But my hypothesis, it may not stand, but so far it fits the data that I've got so far. That's what I'm looking for. That's college level writing in a nutshell. That's what we're going to be working on all semester. I just told you in as many minutes what we're looking for. You will spend the next 16 weeks practicing it because you've got this ingrained idea in your head of what a paper is and what writing is and what school is all about. And I, it's almost like doing therapy in a way. I'm, I'm going to try to uh, rewire you a little bit to get you to be college students. I feel like what I'm teaching you with first year composition is not only how to do composition, but also how to be college students because that's the stage you're at with writing. All right, a lot of stuff. Uh, got more stuff though. For my next trick, I'm not gonna ask you if any questions because it ain't gonna make any sense anyway because I can't talk to you. That's why I like Zoom. Uh, let's open this guy up. This is the active reading PowerPoint. What is active reading, Keith? I bet you're asking, you're dying to know. Uh, well, here we go. This is everything you wanna know about it. First, let's rehash some stuff that I brought up in the last lecture and I've kind of touched on in this one. And I'll touch on it again. Knowledge is constructed. You make meaning. There's no inherent meaning in a word. There's no inherent meaning. Meanings change. They're fluid. Uh, definitions change over time. 
as you can tell by the example with the hypothesis, as a hypothesis gets new data, new perspectives, new ideas, hypotheses change. So what you think is knowledge is really, you know, it, it, it's the best we can do right now. Let's put it that way. Up to this point, this is the best we can say about this. But we leave ourselves open in case new data comes in and might change the whole thing. Uh, first thing, learning is an active, constructive process. We've already talked a little bit about this, too. Learning is active, which means you can't sit there passively and, and not engage me, not talk to me, not get ideas, exchange ideas, all right? You're constructing knowledge, actively constructing it in your head. We talked a little about this. We talked about the recipe, where um, if I say something like, writing a paper is like uh, grandma when she followed a recipe to bake a cake. You know? And then uh, that makes more sense to you. You construct that, you build off of that, like that knowledge you already have. It's like, okay, I know what a recipe is and I know the step-by-step -step process. So that means that writing is a step-by-step -step process and I, it makes more sense. So you're constructing that knowledge. You're const by my words and my images that I'm giving you, which are very abstract, you're making something tangible in your mind. So you are an information constructor. Uh, people actively construct or create their own subjective realities of objective reality. Okay, what that means is there may be something out there that gives you an experience. Um, how you respond to that experience is your reality. You know, um, what you think of it, how you interpret it, how you incorporate that. Um, you're kind of constructing your own view of what's out there. Right? which may or may not be accurate. Um, your perception may be, if I go through this, danger, this, this neighborhood, these people are very dangerous and they may attack me. You know, that's my perception of the reality. Because of little bits and pieces of information I brought in, I've talked to people that I've trusted who say that this is a dangerous neighborhood. I see uh, images on the news of people that look like these people who are attacking people and they're dangerous. So this is a dangerous neighborhood. I can see how you can construct that type of image of reality in your head. Very logical. But then when you find out, um, you walk into this neighborhood and they're not really dangerous, they're just poor. And then you find out they're just people like you. And oftentimes that neighborhood, they're just as afraid of you as you are of them. And you're like, wait, that just, I, I'm re, with this new data, I'm redefining my hypothesis of what this reality is. But up until that point, it's just a given. That's just, and I hear these words all the time. That's just the way it is from students. That's just the way it is. You know, people just do that. That's the way it is. Um, there's drinking on campus. That's just the way it is. If we didn't, if, you know, um, if we had laws against it, people just drink. That's the way it is. That's a constructed per perception. That's, that is a man-made point of view. And like anything man-made, if a man made it, a man can unmake it. You can change these constructions. When I was a kid, um, smoking used to be universal. Um, you either smoked or you were going to smoke. There was an ashtray everywhere. It wasn't even a question of, you know, can you, do you have a smoking section in a restaurant? There was ashtrays at every table. And if you coughed and choked because somebody's smoking a cigar next to you, well, it, too, too bad, so sad. Uh, there's smoked in elevators, smoked in hospitals. I remember going to my doctor and he had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth when he came out to the waiting room. Uh, that's just the way smoking was. And when people came out saying that smoking is cancer causing, we need to ban smoking, um, for a while, the, the popular opinion was, yeah, it's bad. We'll, get, we'll grant that. But it's not going to change because that's just the way it is. It was too widespread. It, everybody did it. Um, you know, there were vested interests in keeping smoking as a, as a, as a habit. Um, it wasn't going to change. And now, uh, with smoking laws, with, with education, with, with changing of perspectives, a couple generations later, um, now, if you light up a cigarette uh, in a classroom, they'll shoot you. you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's the laws have really changed. So there's a, an example of a construct in my lifetime that's changed from this is the perception of reality to a different reality. Uh, new information is linked to prior knowledge. We already talked about that with the cake. So you get that idea. Uh, let's go on. Kenneth Burke. This probably isn't going to make a whole lot of sense. This is a composition research theorist. He's, Kenneth Burke is a rhetorician, foremost rhetorician of the 21st century. And Harry Chapin's grandfather, a little bit of trivia. You probably don't know who Harry Chapin is. Look him up. Um, Kenneth Burke has this quote, 
Man is a symbol-using, symbol-making, symbol-misusing animal. We use symbols. That's what we do. We make them, we use them, we misuse them. Inventor of the negative or moralized by the negative. So that's what I was talking about. We come up with this moral judgment. This is good, this is bad. And once we put that lens on something, a lens is a great metaphor because a lens, as much as it brings something in focus, like these classes are bringing something in focus, outside the lens is out of focus. So we can only see what we're focusing on, but it's very difficult to see what we're not focusing on. Uh, it's moralized by the negative. Separated from his natural conditions by instruments of his own making. In this case, the rhetoric. We say, if I said that neighborhood is bad, I'm separating myself from that neighborhood. I'm not even getting to see these people. I've lost sight of that two-year-old asking questions. And now I've come up with an answer, my own answer, based on texts. And I created this reality in my, my mind that I think reflects reality anyway, this model. And it may be wrong. Uh, goaded by the spirit of hierarchy. In other words, you're goaded by the people that are in charge. You're, you're, you're um, culturally driven or moved by a sense of order. People don't like gaps in information. And we'll even take a rotten theory, or a rotten hypothesis over no information at all. People don't like to say, I don't know, even when that's the truth. They'll take a rotten place taker for that, you know. Um, I know what it is. It's X, Y, Z. That's why in the olden days, in primitive societies, if they saw the earth shake or lightning from the sky and nobody knew why, they would run to the medicine man or the shaman or whoever was the leader at that time. And he didn't know any more than anybody else. But he would come up with some pronouncement saying, oh, it is this guy throwing thunderbolts at his wife because, you know, she's angry at him or the earth is shaking because we didn't sacrifice enough goats or something like that. Um, we, and people would say, fine, great. You know, now we feel like we're in control. Now, if we just get enough goats and sacrifice them, the earth won't shake anymore. Uh, we still don't know what's going on really, but we, we came up with this answer that kind of was a place taker. And now we know the facts. Um, again, we have to keep that, that maybe, uh, maybe it's, who knows, maybe it is sacrificing goats has something to do with the earth shaking. Maybe not. Um, keep it open for new information that comes along. I love this last phrase, rotten with perfection. Uh, I'm not going to explain that one. I'm just going to leave that one hanging, rotten with perspective. What do you, perfection, what do you think it means by rotten with perfection? It's a neat quote, and it's kind of, there's a lot packed in there. And again, this is something that we have in composition theory, uh, but you'll, it, it, we'll, we'll refer to it throughout the semester. What is a text? We already talked about this. A text is a type of communication that uses symbols, signs and symbols to represent cultures and our concepts, values, cultural practice, and group identification. So by that definition, writing is a text, um, dance is a text, colors are texts. These are all texts. Um, this image is by a guy named Magritte. If you're taking art or art history classes, you'll, you'll come across him. One day he held up a picture of a pipe in front of his class and he asked the, the, the class, what is this? And they all said, this is a pipe. In fact, in French underneath it says, this is not a pipe. And he goes, it's not a pipe. And they said, you're sure it's a pipe. I can see it's a pipe. And he goes, well, if it's a pipe, then go ahead and smoke it. Well, of course you can't because it's a picture of a pipe. It's an image of a pipe. But this is what people do. We lend a type of reality to our own images. We, we make these mental and rhetorical constructs and we think it's, we, it's real. It, it, is, it is reality and it's life. Uh, the cigarette thing I was talking about, you know, we think that that's real. That we've got this construct going where cigarettes are popular in popular culture and they represent X, Y, Z. There's a symbolism with cigarettes. You know, tough guys got cigarettes in their mouths. You watch John Wayne movies and they're sharing a cigarette over, you know, in the battlefield, that kind of thing. So this is what the message is that's coming across. Um, we live, we think that's the reality. And it's not necessarily reality. If man created it, man can change it. So think of all the stuff today where you think, well, that's just the way it is. You know, like uh, kids drinking at college, that's just the way it is. 
or uh, people are going to have a, uh, they're going to text drive. That's just the way it is. We can't change it, you know, that kind of stuff. Well, kind of think about that. Think of those, those values, those concepts, those practices. They're just something we created. And we, it kind of goes back to what Kenneth Burke was saying. We've become prisoners of our own concepts, of our own, of our own, con our own constructing. Meetings or negotiations, I, I've already talked about that, but again, I need to repeat it sometimes. You're a partner with the author in making meeting out of text. I'll say this, the author does not hold uh, all the meeting for all the text. If he writes something and you don't understand it, it's not necessarily that you're so dumb. It could also be that he's a rotten author. It could be that. Um, or the author may be writing something, uh, has a meeting there that you can pick out because of your context that he didn't know. He may be completely unaware of. An example of that would be when I was teaching, uh, by doing student teaching for high school. I was, I'm actually certified to teach high school. <laughs> like that'll ever happen. Um, <laughs> but when I was doing student teaching in high school, we were doing uh, Huckleberry Finn. And I remember Huckleberry Finn when I was a kid. When I first read it as a child, I, I, I read it through that lens. And I think, well, this is great, you know, to be a kid going down the river on a raft, and, you know, no responsibilities, go fishing whenever I want to, you know. And that meeting was there. The next time I read it was in my 20s, and I was, it was more from a social activist point of view. It's like, this is terrible. How can a human being own another human being? Um, look, at, look what we did in our country. It's a stain on our history, you know. And that meeting also was there. But then I read it, um, again, I was doing student teaching, we're teaching the same book, and I read it again to teach it, and I noticed that it was written in 1870, five years after the end of the Civil War. And the smartest guy in that book was Jim. Jim was the guy that kept Huck out of trouble. Jim was the one that stayed on the mission of going down the river. Um, Jim was the one that basically was the smartest guy in the book, all within the parameters of slavery at the time. You know, all within the parameters of, of limited education. Limited education, but not necessarily limited IQ. He was the smartest guy in the book. And for a man from a, a border state, Missouri, who actually, Mark Twain actually served in the Confederate Army for two weeks. <laughs> um, so he was actually kind of, you know, from an area that was leading toward the South. To make the statement that the slave is the smartest guy in the book is very controversial. Very controversial. Now. All those meetings were there. All those meetings I, as a reader, were able to draw out of this one story. A couple of points I want to point out. Did, did, did Mark Twain mean any of those meetings? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. Uh, he was just writing from the heart, writing that human, nothing human is alien to the humans thing. Um, but those meetings were there. And I was able to pull it out from my point of view, from my perspective in time and space, I was able to see his book from my subject position and could get some meaning out of it that perhaps he didn't even intend. Um, this is how writing works also. You can see not only what text says, but what set text does. And you can kind of get an insight into the values of the author without the author even saying anything. We'll move on and see more of that. Uh, this is why analyzing a text, remember analysis is pulling things apart piece by piece. Analysis is not simply decoding. Decoding is running your eyes over a word, recognizing what the word means, and moving on. Active reading involves decoding, but it's also these points here, comprehension, association, synthesis of material, categorization. So it takes effort. It takes um, time. You have to do it slowly. Um, you're not just, you're, it's not a race to the end. You know, I kind of, and, and again, this is one of those conversations I have with my wife where we disagree on, on pedagogy sometimes. I kind of <clears throat> shy away from those, the, those uh, reading uh, contests that they have over the summer. If you read 300 books, you get a pizza or something like that. Did you really read 300 books? If you went speed reading through them, do you really understand them? Did you really, were you able to get anything out of them? Um, 
I would much prefer you read one book well over and over again um, at different times during your life um, and, and get different responses to it than read a million books and, and not get anything out of it. And more or less, forget them. How, I mean, how many kids remember all hundred books you read over the summer when you were getting your pizza? You were probably just thinking of your pizza, you know? You read it enough to write some kind of a report at the end to prove that you read the darn thing, and then it's gone. It's forgotten. All right, moving on. Analyzing text. Because it takes time, this is one of the things you're looking for. You're not looking for the single underlining platonic truth. One meaning, um, like we were talking about with Mark Twain. There was many meanings in Mark Twain's book. Okay, There was uh, the social meaning. There was the, the more of the entertaining meaning. There was the uh, political meaning of the, of the context at the time. Um, and more than that. Uh, there are many different ways of reading a book. So you're not going to just run your eyes over it really quickly one time and get all of this stuff. It takes time. It takes focus. It takes multiple readings. Just like it takes multiple revisions of a, of a text, it takes multiple readings of a text to see it from many different angles. It takes discussion of a text. This is why, why you have things like book clubs. You have five people read the same book, they'll get five different responses to it. And it does, one doesn't invalidate the other. There are many different points of view. Hey, I didn't see it like that. You know, that's a good point. All right. One of the things, for example, we were talking about in my 102 class, uh, talking about perspectives and understanding text from a different perspective, is uh, one of the debates they wanted to have was about abortion. We do debates in 102. And abortion's been done to death. It's one of those topics that everybody's done in high school, K through 12. Uh, but if you got a different twist on it, a different context, a different lens, um, it might be an interesting topic. And I said, well, why don't we talk about abortion from the father's point of view? And, of course, everybody goes, what have they got to do with it, right? And I said, well, look at it like this. Let's not talk about whether abortion is right or wrong or whether it's legal or should be illegal. That's been done to death. And let's just assume, hey, it's on the books. People are having legal abortions. You know, let's just move from that point. And I said, look at it from the point of view of a father. If he's a parent, too, and if a woman wants to have an abortion but the man doesn't, um, the story is, well, you know, you're half this child, uh, you, you're responsible for half this child, you're going to be paying child support, you should have thought of that before we had sex, and so forth. So he's got the responsibility. But if a woman wants to have an abortion and the man doesn't, even if the man says something like, sign this waiver, you'll never have to see this kid, I'll take a full responsibility, the woman will say, it's my body, I'll do with it what I want, you know, how dare you, you know, impose that on me. So the man's got all the responsibility for paying for a child that's brought to this world, but none of the say um, as to it's, it's it coming in. So I'm not saying that a man should have all of it or, or uh, you know, or, or but what is his level, what is his voice in it? Where's his voice? Should he have a voice? And if so, to what level? And that's where the debate lies. That's an area of gray. And, and this is what you're going to find out with these gray areas is that Sometimes there's no answer. Sometimes there's no clear-cut answer. You won't come up to, to the answer, but what you'll do is you'll kind of narrow it down through arguing. And, and, and again, arguing doesn't mean yelling and screaming at each other. It means sharing ideas. You'll, you'll be able to narrow it down to a more of a tighter focus. So you're looking at many different perspectives, many different truths, many different ideas from many different people in order to arrive at, at, at a more of a universal uh, truth that, that applies to a broad spectrum. All right. Active reading helps you remember stuff. Um, like this is not active reading, what I'm doing here. I understand, again, that this lecture is coming at you like water from a fire hose, and you probably have tuned out about 10 minutes ago, um, and you're having a hard time focusing. And it's just the nature of the beast. This is what video lectures do. But you also have the advantage of, of stopping it whenever you want to, replaying some parts, looking at things. And it also kind of sparks something that I hopefully be able to say in class without any kind of interruption, right? It's better than nothing. Uh, but what I would much rather have is to present an idea in class and have you guys ask questions about it and show me that you understand it or show me a different way of looking at it 
or giving me a question that's something that I didn't cover that's just not clear to you yet, okay? Same with a book. You don't really have the advantage of talking to the author, per se, uh, but you can bring that mindset to reading a book. You can look at it through an emotional lens, a logical lens, you know, um, you know, just and, and from your context. So in, in that way, it's pathos, ethos, and logos. All those cylinders are firing. All right. Here's some, now that I've talked about it, here's how you do it. <clears throat> when you are reading a book, assess the rhetorical situation. Number one, purpose. What's the purpose of this guy writing this? Is it a persuasion? Is it an argument? Is it entertainment? Is it, enter is it really an argument that's wrapped in a coating of entertainment? So it seems like it's just, oh, this is just for fun. But actually, when you look underneath it, he's actually trying to get a point across and, and make you believe something. All right. What's he trying to do? And what the, audience, what, what the author is trying to do will give you a specific way of looking at that text and, and, and either helping him understand, understand what he's trying to do, but also understand um, whether what he is doing is honest or not. And we'll talk about that later. Audience, who's he writing this for? Um, who's he, if, he, if, if it's a persuasion, who's he trying to persuade? Uh, um, and how is he doing it? Kind of back engineer his, his, his rhetorical plan. What's the author's stance? What does he feel about the material? What does he think about it? What does he think about his audience? Whatever that target audience is. I mean, if it's a guy on one side of the political spectrum writing for people on the other side of the political spectrum, is he going to try to cover his purpose by making it look like whatever these people believe and sneaking in some counter arguments? Or is he going to be, uh, is it going to be an outward attack saying, you people are stupid. If you don't believe this, you're an idiot. And, it, and if he's doing that, is he really writing for these people who are going to reject him right off the bat? Or is he really writing this for people in his own tribe um, that are going to say, wow, what a great warrior you are. You know, you're one of us. Genre. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. Is it a comedy? Is it, uh, you know, is it, a, is it a personal narrative? Is it, uh, you know, an essay? What, how does he have this, this writing package? An arrangement or design? That gets back to what I was talking about. Why is he starting with this scene? Why is he starting with this image? Why is he starting with this word? Uh, what is it about the hook line that hooks? Uh, what is it about the title that encapsulates the whole paper and so forth? How did he do it? Uh, back engineering, like I said before, uh, how he did it. All right. Uh, and I'm using he as generic pronoun. Could be a she. Uh, in fact, my favorite authors are, are she. Is Dorothy Parker is one of my favorites. I, I love what she says. She's the one that said, I hate writing. I love having written. <laughs> Anyway, discourse conventions versus genre conventions. Discourse conventions are the terminology, language, and concepts held by the audience. So in other words, if you're writing for uh, five-year-olds, you're probably not going to be using academic discourse used at the college level. You're going to use a different discourse convention. Um, if it's more of a casual uh, atmosphere, you're going to use a casual register, you know, Hey, you kids. Uh, again, it's not that one writing is better than the other or one's right, one's wrong. It's just that one's more appropriate. Uh, in academic discourse, for example, you never address your audience in the second person. You never say you. It's very imprecise. Genre conventions. What's that? Typical ways information is organized and conveyed within a group. APA, for example, is the format they use in science. MLA is what you're using in this class. Why do we have these? Primarily, if you're doing something in the sciences or the humanities or something like that, if it's in the sciences, APA is the format that's agreed upon. MLA means Modern Language Association. That's what the humanities goes with. And basically, it just makes it that much easier for us peoples in the audience to figure out what the heck you're trying to say. Um, you have certain conventions, certain... Uh, practices, certain, uh, you know, ways of framing language that the way it's framed gives me information, tells me something about uh, what you're trying to say, helps helps you convey the, 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 uh, the message to me. 
Even down to the punctuation, how the punctuation is placed in, uh, in APA, it's a reference page, and works cited, it's called the works cited page, where the punctuation is, where the, the, the colon, uh, the, you know, where, what's, what's italicized and what's not, gives me information about that, that uh, bit of text you put in there without directly telling me. Like if it's italicized, it's a longer work or a book. I know that because in MLA, that's what you do. You didn't have to tell me this is a book. You know, there's no confusion. How you do it is as telling as what you do in writing. All right. Um, not both sides, but many sides. I want you not to think of binaries. I want you to break out of binary thinking. That's the first level. I want you to think of context. Don't think of what's right or wrong. Don't think of I like it, I don't like it. I mean, if there's only one, one, or, one way or the other, uh, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> okay, I want you to think of it through uh, like what 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 what's a socialist lens? What's a what's a, what would people in in the past have thought? What does your grandmother think of this? What do, what do I think of this? Uh, what do women think of it? What do men think of it? Poor people, rich people, all these different contexts to look at the same problem that will give you many different responses and many different answers. Okay. Uh, I think I mentioned Ruby Payne, The Matrix for Understanding Poverty. She looks at, she uses one lens, but she looks at many different uh, aspects of society and shows you how poor people and rich people think, you know. Um, for example, uh, when it comes to money, uh, poor people, if they get a, this is overgeneralized, but it gives you an idea of how culture can uh, affect the way you look at money. Money to poor people is very rare. They don't have enough. They don't get a lot. And when they get it, it's windfall and it's, you know, and life is brutish and short and you better enjoy it while you got it. So if you get like a thousand bucks on the lottery ticket, ooh, you're spending that. You're having fun. You're going out and having a good time. And if people in the neighborhood or your family find out you got a, a thousand bucks, they're knocking on your door looking for a loan and you're giving it to them because in, uh, according to Ruby Payne, according to her, in, in poor families, social connections are more important even than the money. Because you know it's going to be you three weeks from now knocking on their door looking for something, you know. In middle class families, it's more like, um, I got mine, you get yours. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I want $1,000 in the lottery. That's my money. That ain't your money. You want $1,000, go play the lottery. I'll put mine to the bank. Uh, rich people, they don't even really think of money. They think of lifestyles. They, they, they think of investments, but they don't think of the nickel and dime stuff. They don't have to, you know. Um, if they want, they want a car, they buy a car. If you want a house, you buy a house. They, 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 they think like that because of their context. Okay. You have to ask, you can't afford it type thing. So it doesn't mean that the money hasn't changed, right? It's the context that they brought to it, the lens they brought to it, how they see it based on their experiences that changes uh, their responses to money. So think of different contexts, you'll get different answers. Here's how you do this active reading stuff. Uh, I still got some time. Uh, use a pencil. And I know that's hard to do because you've got an internet thingy here and it's all on the internet. Uh, but take a notebook write notes, uh, and if you can, print it out, or if you got a book, annotate it, write on it, write little doodads. And it, I think that Mortimer Adler pointed this out. It's a difference between having a lecture and having a conversation. You're actually conversing with the author in your mind. And it may be something like, you know, you circle a whole chunk. I do this a lot of times. I'll oh, bull. I don't believe it. You know, I'll prove this later. Or I can write something and say, boy, that's just like the time I went to the park or something like that. I'll just, maybe I'll just write park in the corner. Uh, habit, develop academic habits of mind. Uh, first one is curiosity. Be that two-year-old. Uh, make it something you want to know. The third, second one, critical analysis. You know, that's that skeptic part of it. You know, prove it. So what? Says who? Prove it. Uh, maybe. Maybe. Um, Bring a whole healthy do dose of skepticism to everything. Even what I say, uh, even what you you say, you write it down. It's like, okay, do I mean this? Or you know, is this just a mood I was in or something like that? Rhetorical sensitivity. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. But that's basically every word has an emotional value to it. The word is neutral. When you look at some of the language that's on the news especially. A lot of times I like watching the news not for what they say, but how they say it. You can say the same thing 
using different rhetoric and convey a different message uh, subtextually. And oftentimes the subtextual message is a lot more powerful than the overt literal message. So how do you find curiosity when it's not readily available? Uh, you know, sometimes talking to other people helps. You can pick up on somebody else's energy if they're, uh, if they're interested in a topic that you're not interested in. You notice this with teachers. If teachers really like the class, like the subject, really engaged with it, oftentimes you can feed off that energy than one who's just going Bueller, Bueller, you know, and just phoning it in. Uh, critical analysis. Read and write ideas with an eye of finding out what's true. And that, again, takes skepticism. Is that true? Is that not true? It, will that work? Will that hold that idea hold water? In other words, just because some smart guy says it on TV, um, it, 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 it question everything. You know, it may be true, it may not be. Uh, what is the purpose of the writer? You know, what is what's what kind of effect is that uh, that uh, rhetoric that he's using having on the audience? And why is why is and that might be a clue as to what his purpose is and his, his underlying motivations. All right, here's connotation and denotation. You should have had this in high school. Some of you have, some of you haven't. Let's talk about it. Connotation is more the additional meanings of the word, the, you know, that's suggested by the word. Denotation is the literal dictionary. Think D for dictionary, D for denotation. Um, let us skip ahead a little bit. Here's, a, here's an example of connotation and denotation. Um, a Rolls-Royce, the connotative, the denotative, de denotative meaning is it's a large foreign car. That's a Rolls-Royce. When you hear the word, word Rolls-Royce, um, you also associate it with luxury and film stars and royalty and money. So if you've got an author who's writing this, this book, and let's say he or she needs a big car in this book, um, it's going to be a different connotative meaning if she writes down... Um, Ford LTD versus uh, Rolls Royce. There's a little added meaning packed in there. Think of connotative meanings, especially when you're doing your micro themes, because when you're communicating, again, you've got a precious small area to work with. Uh, you got to make every word count. Denotative and connotative meanings will help you convey your message more easily. Um, here's negative and con positive connotation with Rolls-Royce. Again, it really doesn't necessarily reflect the truth. It reflects how some people in certain contexts respond to a word when they hear it. Um, some people hear Rolls-Royce and they think, oh, you're just showing off your money. It's, it's, you're wasting it. It's vulgar. It's bad taste. Um, some people hear Rolls-Royce and they think, ooh, big luxury. Why you know, life of the rich and famous? That's what I want. It's wealth. Yeah. Is one more right than the other? No, but it does reflect a certain context. Um, here's rhetoric in the news, positive and negative connotations. When talking about the people in uh, Portland or in Kenosha, some people will refer to them as rioters. You know, some people refer to them as protesters. Protesters are people who are exercising their Second Amendment rights. I've got a right to protest. We all do. I'm protesting. We don't have a right to riot, though, and those words are not necessarily synonymous. Rioters suggest that they're breaking the law, that they're damaging property, that they're dangerous. Okay? Um, some people were painting signs on the uh, plywood that people were using to cover windows in some of the businesses. They were, they were painting you know, um, slogans on it. Um, if you didn't like the slogan, uh, some people on one side would say that's graffiti. You know, you're 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 defacing the public spaces there. Other people say no, that's a mural. That it's a, it's a public memorial. And, you know, we're making the we're, we're we're making it a little bit better here in a rotten situation. Uh, some people see the people dressed up like uh, military with their jackets and their helmets and their base and everything as as militarized riot police, and it's negative that they're gonna they're gonna. They're going to get us poor protesters. Some people see that they're law enforcement, and they have to have these shields and things to protect themselves against these terrible rioters who are attacking them. You know, So how you use your words uh, can help convey or, uh, or cloud even. Uh, it will affect the, the message. All right. 
what is a rhetorical effect? The emotional effect that you have toward any given word. The extra meaning that you have. You know, here's, here's an example of some more uh, chef versus a cook. Smile versus a smirk. Uh, trailer home versus manufactured housing. I live in a trailer. I live in manufactured housing. You know, they roughly mean the same. What really separates one from the other is the uh, the emotional effect, the connotation that it has. Here's one that I brought up in class a while back. Uh, this is how not only the words you use, but your focus can affect the meaning. Uh, if a shopping center is going in to a city, a uh, new shopping center, this is the headline, new shopping center destroys 300 homes. New shopping center creates 300 jobs. Both headlines can be perfectly accurate, okay? But they are choosing to focus on one aspect of the situation instead of the whole thing. And by focusing on that one aspect, that's where they put your lens, excluding everything else. That's what you're thinking is, is the reality. What you have to do, if you really want to know what's going on in the world, is look at, especially with the news, is look at news from many different angles and find out where those intersections are. And that's usually what the, where the truth is. I mean, if you're looking at something like this, very simply, new shopping center destroys 300 homes, new shopping center you know, creates 300 jobs. Um, but one thing that intersects between those two headlines is there's a shopping center going in. You know, whether it's good, bad, or different, you know there's a shopping center going in, okay? Now, Neither of these headlines are necessarily lying, um, but they're, it's not the whole truth. And you can actually tell a lie by omission. You can tell a lie. You can actually create and construct a, an image of reality um, by just leaving stuff out. Uh, that's enough for today. I talked at you a lot. Uh, that's pretty much the, the big ideas that I wanted to get across. Well, I want to go back to, I want to share the screen again. Let's get out of this. Ta-da. Ta-da. I want to just make sure that we are all on the same page in terms of what to do this week. Week two. Make sure all the assignments are uploaded from last week. If you're late. If you're late, you're late, but I'd rather you be late than not do it at all, okay? When it comes to uploading your papers, I'm going to ask you this. Give me some time. Again, you are many, I am one, um, and I, is, I like to actively read, okay? So it's going to take me a while to, I'm not just going to run my, my eyes over these papers and pencil whip it and give you a grade. I want to actually be able to look at these papers and, and find out what's going on in your heads, you know, so um, I've got four classes. You've got one paper. For every one paper I assign, multiply that by 100 people. Um, I got more to do than you. So give me some time. Uh, make sure you would, uh, attend this week's Zoom meetings, both Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to have another thing on Thursday. Uh, we're rolling here. We'll eventually get to a point where they become workshops, but we're not at that point yet. It's going to be a little bit. Read chapter three, rhetorical situations. Ah, it folds right into what I want to talk about this week. Savage Life is going to be due this week. Read it twice. Read it one time, front to back, as one solid piece, you know, to get a uh, feel for it as, as one essay. And then look at that assignment sheet that goes along with it and go through it line by line. Don't worry about the SQR uh, part in the middle so much. Run your eyes over that and just kind of get a feel for it. I'm not going to go too much of that into that in this class right now. What I want you to do is read that assignment, the, 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 the assigned reading, and then go over those, those questions that I have, and then just go ahead and write paragraph one, and then just answer the question, one, two, three, here are the answers. You don't have to write the question out, just put the, question, the answers down. Then paragraph two, you know, and so forth. Uh, EA, everyone's an author, read those chapters there, those pages. Writer's biography, that's going to be due week four. So we got two weeks to do that. Let's look at that. Writer's biography, where would I find that, Keith? I bet that'd be under micro themes and essays. There it is. I found it. All right. Uh, you can read that. We'll read that in class. But this is what I want you to look at. 
and we talked about this, this personal narrative, it's a personal narrative, so you can use I and B, um, is different from any other you've been required to write. So you don't have to use any kind of sources for this one. You're using your own brain and your own experiences. But it's deceptively difficult. Um, I, this is more akin to a psychological profile with you as the subject. For this essay, I want you to describe how the events of your life have shaped your attitudes, perspectives, and reactions to the writing process that make you the writer you are today. I don't want to read about every detail of your life. I don't want to read about just school writing. If you make it just school writing, you're not doing the assignment. I want more different types of writing spaces brought in there other than just school. I don't want to be just a big long gripe about I hate school or I love school or whatever. You've done a lot more writing than school, and I'm challenging you to put that in this paper. All right. So if you want an A, put in more than just school writing. I want you to pick out a few life events that best illustrate who you are as a writer. This, this, these, each event should connect to the attitudes, perspectives, and or reactions you hold as a writer today. For example, this, describe how an embarrassing experience in third grade may be why you hate public speaking today. Public speaking is a rhetorical act. Or how a writing award in fifth grade solidified your decision to be an English major. Yeah, two examples of school writing. But again, it may be something like... Um, I really need to express myself on Facebook because uh, people like my statuses and I've got some, somewhat of a, a Facebook personality or a YouTube personality. And I love creating bit uh, of things for YouTube, but I hate school writing. That's the area I want you to look at is, okay, so what is it about YouTube that I like and school writing that I don't? And it may be something like uh, I get to choose my topic for YouTube. All right. And I don't for school. It's forced on me. Well, then if I could do something like, well, I'm going to give you an assignment, but you could choose your own topic. See, I could take something from the stuff you like and still accomplish the goals of what we need to get done. And we could come up with that compromise. All right. So that's what I'm looking for. Go outside of school. Uh, bring outside writing in. Compare and contrast it as a tool. This isn't a compare and contrast paper. It's a personal narrative. But use compare and contrast as a tool to see what falls out between those comparisons. This is more difficult than it sounds. You may think, well, I don't have any kind of outside reading. I don't have any kind of outside writing. This will be a snap. I'll wait till the night before it's due. And I guarantee you'll just give me a pile of, uh, of crap. Don't do that. Um, I want you to be both the subject and the author. And you have to look at yourself as data impartially. It's kind of hard to do. It's hard to be objective when you are when you're the subject, when you're by definition subjective. And you analyze the events of your life, observe how those have you reacted to those events. And there's that funny word again, hypothesize on the on the effects. If you're doing it right, you are writing to learn. In other words, you'll be using the writing process as a learning tool. You'll find something out about yourself in the process that you could not have predicted you would find out. Um, when you first started this project. Okay, let's skip down to here. The rest of the stuff we'll read in class, but let's skip down to here. This is a diagnostic paper. Show me what you got, okay? I am going to be interested in both the process and the product. So in other words, I'm not only interested in your final paper, but how you, what process you took to get to that paper. Did you contact the writing center? And I know because they send me, when, whenever one of you guys go to use, access the writing center, they send me a notification of who you talked to, what you talked about, what time it was, all that kind of stuff. So we, we keep tabs on you. Um, or contact me. Um, what did you do to help you get an audience member um, to look over your paper and give you feedback? So I'm looking to the process of writing the paper as well as the final product, which is the paper itself. Get feedback, ask questions. Again, you're not in it by yourself. Uh, point number two, this is a six-page minimum, no maximum. In other words, again, I can't tell you on page six you're going to come up with this great insight into who you are as a writer. You know, this is something that you're going to learn in process. But I can tell you after doing this for 12 years plus, that uh, it's going to take at least six pages to get to this point where you're, you're actually finding out something about yourself. In fact, it, if, it's, if it's right at six pages, it better be sparkling prose. And six pages means six 
full pages. It doesn't mean five pages with one line at the top of page six. It doesn't mean five pages and a half of page six. It doesn't mean six pages if it's 14 point font or if you change the font on just the punctuation because I check this stuff. You know, it doesn't mean just making the margins bigger, all the other tricks to try to squeeze out the number of pages. Uh, six full pages, right? And number three, as with all submissions in this class, I have to say it again, doc or docx attachment to my SIU email from your SIU email. Send it to me from you in SIU email, not SharePoint, not PDFs, not anything else, not Word, Works, Microsoft Works, not some goofy programming program like that. Send it in one format, in one channel, if you want me to get it. All right. Uh, we already talked about the six full pages. We all also talked about expand beyond school writing. And the last one, expand beyond mere emotional reaction. Not, don't think of like and dislike. Again, think of what engages you, what works and doesn't work, you know, where your interests lie. And interest is more than just like or dislike. You know, I don't want to, you know, heck, a worm in a Petri dish can do that. You give him an electrical jolt, he doesn't like it, he goes to the other side. I don't want that. I want more like, how does your curiosity work? Um, where, 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 are you, where, where are you focused on? Where, where are your ultimate goals? Who are you as a person? This is not only gonna show me who you are as a writer, but it's got a real purpose and it tells me who's sitting in my classroom, what your skill levels are, um, what your, where your interests lie, and all that data I can use to help construct the class to better uh, conform to what you need to get your, again, in our collaboration to get your tail out of 101 and into the next level. How can we make school writing better? Put in some of these things. So, so now based on this, uh, this observation, give me the evaluation, the upper level thinking skills. You know, you're analyzing your life, different parts, not just one part, but different parts. Your, your, your fun writing, your not so fun writing, your school writing, journaling, diaries, texting, all that kind of stuff. You're synthesizing it together and you're evaluating it to come up with this claim to hand to me saying, Keith, this is what we can do for me to make this class a little better, all right? If there's anything I'm doing right, uh, odds are it comes from these kind of exercises. And if there's anything I can do better, it's gonna come out of these exercises too, all right? So this has real purpose for you and for me. That's actually one of the things I got back in feedback from my students. They don't wanna just do mindless exercises and workshops and drills. They want their writing to mean something and have power. Uh, to have some kind of an application in a real world. You know, they're saying, this isn't what the real world does. Here's a real world application. I'm, I'm giving you an invitation. Write this paper to help me teach you better. And if you choose not to do it, that's your choice. But don't blame me, okay? Uh, that's it. That's all I got for you. Uh, go back to this. Uh, if there's any kind of questions or stuff, hopefully we can take care of them in class. Again, I'm packing a lot into a small amount of time. We have to hit the ground running. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to do it. Uh, so thank you for your time and uh, hope this works. And I hope Zoom works next week too. All right. Thank you very much. See you in class.